السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على رسوله الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين. Okay, how was lunch, everybody? Did everybody have a superb lunch like I did? Oh. No. I had a great lunch. Did No, it was not very good. What happened to the, uh, the wet flour? What happened to it? Okay. I was told someone brought me something in the morning. No, no, you're going to run and get it now, Ahmed. <laughs> Not like I'm going to eat while I'm talking. It's not going to be. Look, let me explain to you the whole thing with biryani, okay? <laughs> okay, let's finally explain the biryani. Uh, there was, uh, I used to teach at this school for like five years, and uh, the, the youth were getting to the level where now they're supposed to start giving khutab and start giving speeches. So uh, we were supposed to instruct them on how to give, you know, give a good speech or how to make your speech worthwhile to people. So I gave them this analogy and involved biryani. I told them, look, a good speech is like a plate of biryani. You'll understand. I told them, if you eat biryani at a generous person's house, there's a lot of meat there, you know? You don't have to hunt for the meat. The meat's right there. And this is my problem with biryani. When you eat biryani at... Uh, a stingy person's place, and they used to sell biryani in this masjid. Oh, there's no meat, it was just rice. It's spicy rice. And you gotta hunt, hunt, hunt. When you see a piece of meat, you're like, <laughs> like you found a treasure. You're so happy, oh, there's meat. So then I eat the piece of meat and I hunt, hunt, hunt. Oh, there's a small <laughs> You know, so I told him your speech is like a plate of biryani. Don't give people rice. You know how some people, their khutab are like, no ayat, no hadith. Brothers, we need to be good. Brothers, let's be kind. Brothers, let's uh, fast. Brother, no, give me hadith. Be kind, give me hadith. Let's fast, give me an ayat. Give me meat. So your speech, the meat in your speech, your ayat and your hadith, that's the meat. So the more meat you have, because when you eat this spicy rice, one hour later you're hungry again. People come on, on Jumu'ah and they want you to, input, to and you help them increase their iman and learn something. Nourish them spiritually. Give them a lot of meat. Don't just give them rice. You see? And so that's where the whole biryani thing came. So uh, from there it became apparent my dislike of biryani if a non-generous person makes it. And all you get is just rice. You have to hunt for meat. You know, I like my meat to be right there on the top. I like it to be clear and visible. It's, it's talking to me. Hello, here I am. You know? I don't want to hunt for my meat. What is this? So, so that's the whole idea. So I don't have any problem with biryani as long as a generous person makes it. You know? But if you want me to go on a, on, on, on a wild goose chase looking for a piece of meat, I'm not interested in that. So it's not that I hate biryani or dislike it. I can actually eat it. I'm going to eat it any time. You know, you want to go right now, let's go. But, you know, let's have it... Uh, good. So your khutbah, your speech should be like that. Don't just give people rice. We're like brothers, we should be good. Brothers, we should be nice. Give me ayah, give me hadith. Keep, fill people, spiritually nourish them, and then send them off. That's the whole very yeah. thing. So, so, you know, I promised you a poem. I actually forgot my poem today, the, the kebab poem. <coughs> forgot it. But I think I memorized another one. It's a bit shorter, though. It's a uh, it's a it's a friend of mine. We used to eat a lot together, you know, and uh, and actually he used to eat a lot, believe it or not. Back then we used to weight train and stuff, so he used to eat a lot. So me and this guy, we were like you know monsters, and uh, and like he you know if I ever like was in some town that I don't know, I basically he knew all the restaurants. So I would call him and say, yeah, I'm at the corner of this and that. He's like, you know, if you go two blocks, there's a good restaurant. <laughs> So, then he got married, and I got married, and we never ate out together again. So I wrote him this poem, where I told him, Sadness fills my heart and fills the sky. Marriage forces us to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> the sun has risen, but it hasn't shone. You know I don't like to eat alone. <laughs> Whenever I was hungry or was in the mood, calling you was like dialing 1-800-FOOD. 
<laughs> you had extensive knowledge of every branch and location, even pricing, menus, and hours of operation. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, but now we don't eat and we don't mingle. I wonder if you still eat like when you were single. <laughs> so, and we used to go to this place, it was a phenomenal Afghan restaurant, and they had something called chopan, which is uh, lamb chops. But they were the best lamb chop place there. So I said, so give me a call sometime if you can to eat some kebab or maybe chopan. <laughs> or for a light snack at the all you can eat, let's make them suffer another defeat. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that day when somebody just puts that on YouTube or something. <laughs> Usually when I give the speech, the camera's off, you know, <laughs> give the poems and stuff. <laughs> okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, one, okay, let's get started, inshallah. One, one other method. So what do we have as methods right now? All the ways that we've mentioned. Just read through your notes. Quantifying the argument. Uh, Using the flip side of the argument. Um, Go ahead, just yell them out. Making analogies, comparisons to dunya. Statistics, statistics and facts. Sometimes, uh, you know, you 1 plus 1 equals 2, link it to why we do that, it's linked to Allah Azzawajal. It's not about this specific small action here. It's linked to the greatness of Allah Azzawajal. Or that sometimes you shame people out of something, like the guy who says, I can't leave pork. Are you serious? Um, uh, okay. There's, there's something, sometimes you, you, you might encounter someone with the weirdest arguments. And so just like when a Muslim comes to you with something weird, what do you tell them? What's your dalil? What's your proof? So you can actually use this with other people. Like one time, this guy, you know, some, again, this is an example of when you, ex you encounter someone, that, something you never heard of before. So I kept asking him, you know, what is, um, you know, I, 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 I say this, he says that. I say something else, he brings these arguments that I've never heard of before in my life. They don't make any sense. So the easy way is to go to his or her source, and then let's talk about where you got this information from. And then let's look at that in detail and prove that that's false, that way I get rid of all your arguments. So when I went to do it with this person in this specific case, I said, okay, where did you get all this from? It was really weird. weird. And I said, how do I tackle this guy? Then I thought, oh, where is he getting this from? Why am I accepting this information? So I said, okay, where did you get this from? Which book? Which teaching? So he basically started to say some gibberish about it being, um, you know, analysis and contemplation about certain historical events that have taken place. So I said, you made it up? I said, <laughs> the guy made it up, you know, it made life easier for me. Sometimes when you're doing biblical discussion, they make things up. Like one time I asked, uh, I was asking this one person, I was basically taking him through, you know. So I said, um, did, did, you know, is Jesus, obviously, these are questions that are known. They have to say yes to them. Is, is Jesus co-equal to the Father? Is equal? Because if they say less, then we have a problem. He said, yes, they're equal. So was he, did he take part in creating the earth? Yes, he created the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. He was part of that. Now, did he know that he was going to be sent down to die for people's sins? Or was it just like, you know, he just opened a piece of paper and said, that's your mission. And he suddenly found out. So, oh, he knew. He knew even before the earth was created that he was going to go and die for people's sins. All right, then. So then when he was put on earth, he, he wasn't forced and pushed into this mission. He was accepting to do it, right? He has to say yes, because if he says no... That's obviously a lesser God being forced to do something he doesn't want to do. So then, okay. So while he was on earth, was he aware of this idea or he totally forgot who he was and what the mission was? No, he knew it 100%. All right. So why is it then that when he was about to be arrested, he said he goes to the rooftop and he makes the, the dua. He says, Father, let this cup pass from me. And let this not happen to me. So before the earth was created, he knew he was going to come and die for people's sins. And, and he knew it while he was on earth, and while Adam was created, and while things were happening. And, and then suddenly, when before the, you know, the, the arrest, one of the events leading to it, he says, let this not happen to me. And then when he's put on the cross, what does he say? 
My Lord, why have you forsaken me? What do you mean, why have you forsaken me? He knew this was the plan. And how can you understand what's the problem with that argument? Why would he say, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken you? That was the plan. Before he created the earth, he was there, according to that. So you know, when I said that, the guy said, oh, yeah, that was the human Jesus. The human side of Jesus. You see? That's just an excuse, right? So, and, and I know that I need to say, well, what's your proof? So I said, oh, really? That's very interesting. Never heard that before. And which uh, verse is this in? He said, uh, well, it's not in the Bible. Okay, look, let me tell you. And now, yeah. and look, this is the problem we have. Is that when there's a description, is that you, you always you add these things, you make these things up to justify your argument when it comes to Jesus. Like when someone is named, referred to as the Son of God in the Bible, you don't take it literally, right? Just like uh, you know, Adam and others referred to as sons of God. You don't take it literally, David and so on. But here when it comes to Jesus, you take it literally. I hear it's literal, and that's what it means. And so, you know, you make up things like, oh, here it was the human side of Jesus. Here's the, so where did you get this from? And you don't, it's not from, from the passage. You just make that up. So, um, and it's not like, you know, the, like the human side takes over, then the God side takes over. It's not like, we're talking about Dr. Bruce Banner or something. You know? <laughs> the Hulk takes over, and then the human side takes over. What are we talking about here? So, at one time, another person gave me another argument. They said that it's like, it's like you know, you coming to work now. You got out of bed in the morning. He didn't want to come into work, but you have to come into work. You know, that's why he said, you know, he he knew he had to do it, but he's like didn't want to do it. So, yeah, you're talking about someone that you claim to be a god. Who's gonna force a god to do something he doesn't want to do? And he, I have to work because I have this weakness, right? I, I need to work. And if I was a, a trillionaire, you think I would? You know, be sitting here talking to you. I didn't say that. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that. But that so you're using the wrong comparison. So always say, what's your source? Where'd you get that from? That also helps you a lot because a lot of stuff that's out there is made up. If if I can't tackle the idea itself because it's attached, it's linked to the the, the source. Let's talk about that source. Who wrote this book? What year did it surface? And you know what's so perfect about it? What's what about it makes it that it couldn't be written? Couldn't have been written by any human being. You know, like you read the Book of Mormon. There's nothing about that book that says it, a man couldn't have written it. Nothing. And even the, the information in it, if you want to argue, well, he couldn't have done all the historical. But it's still stuff that's attainable by man. And a man can still gather that info, and no matter how and where they get it from. It's still material that can be written by a man, you know. You look at the Qur'an, it's not material that can be gathered by or written by a human being. Even today, you know, from, from and you've probably attended some lecture or another where it's about the grammatical miracle or grammatical style of the Qur'an where this word here or this letter is here in this verse but it's taken out in the next verse. Just that letter missing here, what does it mean and how much it changes the meaning and it's just so, so phenomenal that you know a human being can sit and think of that. Let me take this letter out, letter, not word, and that's for the next verse, and it's going to have this meaning. Unbelievable. You know? Or if you pause here, it means that. If you pause there, it means that. Just incredible. But nothing about the Book of Mormon, you know, or Bible, or other scripture says, you know, you can't, this can't uh, be, have been written by uh, a man. That's why You've probably you know heard and seen some of these experiments where, but unfortunately they're not like documented. And maybe one of you might want to do this. There was a guy, he would just bring non-Muslims in a room, but he didn't videotape it. You might want to do it. He would just recite Ayat al Kursi to them, and then he would ask them, "How does that make you feel?" He doesn't tell them, "Look, I'm going to tell you Quran or Word of God, anything." He would just sit them down, recite Ayat al Kursi, and then say, "Okay, then ask them, interview them. How did you feel?" Subhanallah, the stuff people used to tell them. Most of them will tell me, I think, I don't know what you said, but it made me feel strange, or it made me feel good, it made me feel calm. Or they would say, um, you know, those weren't the words of a human being. I think those were the words of God. One guy tells him, I think you were reciting the words of God, and I think it's talking about the attributes of God. Can you imagine that? One of the Mashayikh, Shaykh Muhammad Arif, you guys know? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Phenomenal, huh? And he actually used to study with Shaykh Walid. But don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start with Sheikh Walid. So, uh, in front of the Sheikh, 
And uh, he did this thing, I, I, I've watched this, but he was recently in Denmark or one place up there, I can't remember, and basically he went up to a nun and some other guy in the street and he says, through a translator, he said, I want to, I'm going to recite some things to you. And he said, and he has a very nice recitation, if you know. So he starts to recite regular speech to them. And there was a boy, his name was Muhammad, and he went to the market and he bought some apples, but he recited it like it was Qur'an. Same way, same voice, same tone, rhythm. And uh, then he said, I'm going to recite something else to you. And they don't speak a word of Arabic. And he starts to recite from the Qur'an. He says, was well, there any difference between the two recitations? And the nun tells him, yes, look at this, people don't speak Arabic. The first one, were like the word, they were just normal, no impact, they were like the words of a man. And I think the second ones were, the second one was the word of God. Can you imagine that? Just, she just felt there was something there. You know, you know. Uh, maybe I told you the story of the. Did I tell you the story of the da'i that was uh, the, the missionary that was disrupting the da'iyas at the da'wah table. No. So basically, these people that have da'wah table, some Muslims, and this guy just kept harassing them, trying to stop them from reaching prospects and just making problems and jumping in while they're talking. So then one of them got upset, he pulled them, took them to another room to sit down, made them sit down, gave them a copy of the Quran, translation in English or meanings. He, opened, he said, open any page and read. He okay, opened just a random page, started to read. And he asked him, does that look like the writing of a man? He said, no. He said, open any other page. He said, open another page. Read. He read. Does that look like the writing of a man? The guy said, no. He said, open another page. Any page. He opens it. Read. He starts to read for a while. Does that look like the writing of a man? And he wouldn't answer. And when this guy raised his head, he was in tears. That's the Quran, people. You know, this story that I heard, I, I knew this story. Then I discovered another person experienced the exact same thing. You may have heard the story about the young girl. And, and again, it has happened to two people, the exact same story. This young girl, she was about 14, she got a copy of the Quran from her school library, came home, her parents were somewhere, so she was locked out of the house. She said, I sat down in front of the steps, took out the Quran, she wanted to read something. She started to read. She read Alif, Lam, Mim, Dalika, Kitab, Al-Aragrafi, started to become Muslim. Why? She said, no human being begins his book like that. This book, that wherein there is no doubt. Have you ever seen a human write a book like that? In the beginning chapter it says, there is no doubt about this entire book. Have you ever heard that? This girl immediately knew this has to be from Allah. So I'm reading one verse or two verses. So the Quran is so, so, so powerful. It is the most powerful that one tool, if you can call it that. The most powerful tool you have. That's why the atheist, if I don't have time for the atheist, say here, Quran. No way he's going to read the Quran and think, oh, this looks like just a regular book. No way. You, know? you might want to give him guidelines as to how to read the Quran. That's why don't worry about anybody. Don't be scared of anybody. Okay? Don't be afraid of anybody. That's <laughs> a push. So, um, <laughs> I'm not hip yet. <laughs> okay. Um, look, let's do this. I've got, uh, I've got one, two, three. There are three more techniques, but what I want to do now, we're going to do some of the questions. All right? So, Ahmad is going to read the question to us, and this is, we need to do it like this, alright? You're going to keep your, you're going to, be, you're going to keep your reputations, or your arguments, or your explanations very, very, very short. Now, I'm just going to repeat them out again, very quickly. Just make sure you let me understand your main point. Once I get it, just stop. That, we need to do it because we have a lot of questions, we don't have too much time, we want everyone to, we to get, get, a, get a quick run through, yeah? So, and it's also very good training for you to learn to be brief. A lot of times we, we're so used to long-winded responses, long-winded explanations. Just be very, very brief. Please uh, raise your voice, brothers or sisters, but I think most of us can hear the sisters. So brother, when you speak, you, put, you raise your hand up, you say out loud, and then uh, you, we're going to jot down these points. So if it says, look, if we're starting with Aisha, is that the number one thing? So, you know, maybe on the back of one of the pages, you're going to write Aisha, then you click one. That's one argument. I can say two. Second argument. Three. 
Third one. So the first one is the age of Aisha radiallahu anha, and just we've already spoken a little bit about it. Let's just get some of the points. Just give me a quick point. Okay. So like if you want to say this was common at the time of Arabia, you're just going to say this was known at the time of Arabia, right? And go. Shiraz. Would a pedophile want to uh, marry his, uh, the woman he's uh, with? What do you mean? <coughs> Would a, a pedophile, if you look at a pedophile uh -huh. these days, they don't marry it. Okay, I see. Out there with. They don't right. marry the woman they're with. Okay, so the argument, the pedophile would not marry the, uh, the child or the person that they're with. Yes, sir. Quraysh would have attacked him on it. Quraysh would have used that to attack the Prophet He would have used it against him. Yes, yes sir. So he consummated three years later or so. Why would he wait? You know, a pedophile. You know, they don't. They don't wait. Why wait for what? Excellent. Yes. Well, at that time, um, kids, like especially girls, they used to mature. Okay. So Aisha in the hot climate, people mature faster, and then slash Aisha Rabbi herself was said to be larger in for large for her age. Yes. She was already engaged before the Prophet. She was already engaged before the Prophet. She was spoken for by someone else, which shows you that it was common. Slash also, Umar anhu married Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Ali. Later on, she was very young, he was very old. It shows you nothing is wrong with that. Okay, yes? What did Aisha say about the fact that after he passed away, it was opinion of the Prophet? What was Aisha's opinion of the Prophet? She feel that, you know, she was a young child taken advantage of. Was it a normal thing for her? Did she ever consider, oh, my age factor was an issue? Never. Good. Yes, sir. Um, I think this is more of a question, but uh, I, read, I read a couple of places that Aisha really was not age is actually not nine. Like that it was 18? <laughs> keep going, keep going. Relax, everybody. Yeah. I, I read from a couple of Islamic websites like that it's actually from, uh, there's a debate and there's, it's from 12 to 22, something like that. Uh -huh. Okay. And I've also read that. But we're going to start stick with our, uh, defending the, the younger age. Because, especially if it's 18 or 19 or 22, we don't have to defend that. So we're, we're working on the exercise of defending how you answer the, the young age. Because the older age, you obviously don't need to argue for it. Which is another point you can add now, that if, if the Prophet wanted a younger person only, why is it that the other wives, some of them were in their 50s, some were in their 30s, three were in their 30s, three were in their 20s, and three were in their teens. And it wasn't it that all of them were young. That's another point. What else? You had something? Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Ahmed? Puberty is a natural indicator of women. Sorry? Puberty is a natural indicator of women. Jakal Lukhay, puberty is a natural indicator One of our, from our revert brothers, and he'll say, okay, why does a woman reach puberty so early? What's the use then? So, puberty, okay, it's a natural thing. Yes, you had something? Um, basically kind of something similar to like basically what Ahmed said. Okay. I think the lost fellow was telling me that because you know, there's like basically limitations of action and there's basically guidelines, basically the age like, could be a limitation of how of um There was no limitation you said? The wisdom of the limitation itself. Because I don't use best as I was talking about this in one of his mm -hmm. one of his lectures. Okay. But okay, exactly. Um uh, uh what else was there? Anything else? Yes. Why in this society is it wrong to marry a young girl, but young girls can run around half naked? Or they can run around and get active, you know, <laughs> right? So that's another argument. The third, another one you want to add, uh, you know, who says that uh, this is, you know, you're, you, again, what, what uh, Basin did, right? He said, you're using, like, what you feel is right to judge other cultures and other norms based on your culture. But that's assuming that you are right, that 18 is proper. Anything else is improper. Who's, who says that? Okay. That's it. Yeah, this, is not, this is a directly addressing the issue, but one, one person said that Mar, uh, Mariam, I'm really being pleased with her, was the age of 12, 11 or 12 when she gave birth to Isa the Isa. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know of that, but if that's the case, then that's another argument. Uh, yes, last one. Any questions? Uh, why the Prophet Muhammad Wahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married such a young uh, lady? Uh -huh. And they were question why uh, their uh, girls like go around and lose their virginity. Thank you, sir. Yes, exactly. We said that. Very good. 
Okay, so خلاص أحمد أحمد حب. What's the next one, please? Why can't women lead the prayer? Why can't women lead the prayer? Let's hear it. I mean, lead men in prayer. Why can't women lead men in prayer? Let's hear it. Yes, sir. Because they're what? Because they're ladies. <laughs> and why can't lead? Why can't ladies lead men in prayer? Because they're girls. And why can't girls lead? Because they're female. Yes, sir. It's different responsibility. Of men and women, mm-hmm. men are responsible to, 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 to lead the birth women. I mean, not like you don't see men, uh, you know, like birth, uh, it's just different responsibilities. Different responsibilities, okay. Different responsibilities, okay. Yeah. We want to hear from the sisters, yes, yeah. Uh, Please, sorry, if you can raise your voice, Habibi. Men won't concentrate on the prayer. Oh, they wouldn't concentrate. They would all fight to be in the first row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so they wouldn't concentrate, right? They wouldn't concentrate. What else? Sisters, please feel free. I need to just say. The what? Right, and it wouldn't be appropriate for the woman to be in the front. Uh, yes, Shiraz? There'd be times that women couldn't lead the prayer. There would be times when they couldn't lead the prayer. So the, the Imam al Ratib is a woman, she's paid to lead the five salawat, and there are times when she wouldn't be able to lead the prayer. That's a problem. Uh, Hamza? Uh, if she's leading the prayer, then probably the other women are between the other brothers in the prayer and the line. Yeah, where, where the other women go. So, okay, that's another issue. Uh, yes, young man? Uh, lady has to be with other ladies. She can't be by herself. Yeah, it'll be weird that if, let's suppose we left it as men in the front, women in the back, but women can lead the men sometimes. So she'll be like right up there amongst the men, and then there's men, and then there's women again. It's just a really weird situation. Let's, let's use the same argument now. Why, why, aren't, why weren't any women prophets of Allah? And I wonder sometimes when Muslim women ask us why weren't like, And they ask with like, I mean, they, not the ones in Calgary, mashallah, the ones in Calgary. <laughs> but they argue with attitude. Like, you know, and like they're objecting against Allah. Why aren't any women prophets? So come on, think about it. Let's think about it together. And, yes, yes. Men are just natural leaders. <laughs> no, you know the brother's wife is not in the room. You know it. <laughs> he said men are natural leaders. All right. Okay. When is the last time that representative from an army well, was a woman was sent to another army? Okay, so, so now let's break it down nice and soft. Don't, don't take it easy, remember? The sister's in the room. When is the last time a woman led an army? Let me relax. Okay? Look, let me... Let, let me Put your hand, sorry, I'm exaggerating to what you said, but let me put what you said in a diplomatic way, you know? You say from the response, amongst the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> amongst the responsibilities of, the, of, of a prophet of Allah is also to be the leader of the army. And in this specific role, the woman would not be any, a good, uh, this would be a good position for her as well. There's some other points, yes sir? A woman's reputation is much easier to tarnish. Okay, that's also true. He said the woman's reputation is easier to tarnish. And that's very true, right? That's why there's severe punishment against a man accusing a woman of something with no witnesses. That's why he's beaten and whipped and punished for that. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, physically, they can easily be defeated. Oh, man, but make it, make it smoother. <laughs> physically, they can easily be defeated. <laughs> Walk around like... <laughs> This is a joke I do with my wife. I always go like this. <laughs> but my wife, she doesn't mess around. She's like, come on! <laughs> That's it. And uh, when her people need her, when she goes on maternity leave. Thank you. Maternity leave, that's a problem. When the prophetess of Allah has uh, yeah, any PMS, any, you know, and she's cranky. Come on, people. I'm ter- it's serious. So it's weird when people say things like this. Yeah or when she can't lead the Salah anymore, or and now during that time of the month she has to lead the armies in two months of, of journey and jihad. It's different, and it just doesn't make sense. People just ask without thinking. You know, if you think about it, it's actually unfair for a woman to be a prophet of Allah. And then she's pregnant for nine months and it's weird, and, and it's weird. <laughs> yes, sir? Uh, uh, sorry, we'll get to the system. Yes, sir? If you see the stories of uh, Paris missions, then you can well understand that most of the uh, male persons are even unable to uh, go with this type of difficulty. Mm-hmm. So 
The, the burden was so heavy, some of the prophets of Allah and he, and he had difficulty with the burdens and the difficulties they experienced. Yes, sister? I'm sorry, I didn't get you exactly. For example, with a race, mm -hmm. a person standing outside, the race are standing at the outmost, which has that opportunity to stand in the front, mm -hmm. um, and the one inside, because they have a shorter distance to run, they're at the back. So that's the lead given to men, since we are in, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's only about your iman. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, excellent. So, Zakil Khair, and I'm happy that a sister said that, you know. I don't have to say, you know, you weep more or whatever. But good, Shiraz, and uh, let's end it there. Uh, the fact that all prophets and messengers were men has never hindered women from getting into Jannah. Exactly, you know, th do you have to have a prophet that's a, a female? Does it have to be? Or what's the point? The point is the message of Allah comes to humanity, Akhwan. That's the point. So, why is this, again, the radical feminist movement th thinking that, you know, men do this, women do this. Why do the men do this and the women can't do this? Why is a man a prophet? What? Yani, so, uh, so the other brother is saying a very good point. If the whole point is the message of Allah reaches humanity, people go to Jannah. It doesn't matter if tribe, you know, if prophets came from this tribe or that tribe, or, or they spoke this language versus, versus that language. And then we're going to have people, so, you know, you might complain, well, how come the prophet spoke to a man there? It's not an issue, as long as the message reaches people. But, okay, next point, Ahmed? Uh, difference between Sunni and Shia. Okay, skip that one, or we'll make a circle or mark around it, we can come back to it later. Next one? Uh, polygamy. Okay, polygamy, and, and really we're talking about polygyny, right? Because polygamy is just when one of the spouses marries more than the other. Which, so polygamy includes, includes polygyny and polyandry. So, of course, we don't have that polyandry stuff, so it's polygyny, right? And the male marries more than the why is that permissible? Quickly now, these are quick, short points. Yes? Yes? Men to, women, men to women ratio. Men to women ratio. Two. Yes? To reduce corruption. Now? To reduce Go ahead. Corruption. Reduce corruption when you're able to marry more, right? Yep. Okay, great. We, me and you, we set up citizens against corruption in Calgary. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Should us. I have greater sexual desires. Okay, thank you. I won't repeat that. Yes? <laughs> uh, easier to trace lineage. Easier to trace lineage. That's very true. Yeah, I th sometimes Muslim women with attitude, of course they're not from Calgary, <laughs> they would attitude and come and say, how come a, a woman can't marry four? Are you kidding me? Are you serious about this question? And actually there was something, some documentary of this, where they tried that. A woman married two. It's just despicable. The whole idea is, he has to take care of four men's houses, four men's and different children, and clean and cook and all that. And just physically impossible also. And lineage, and one of the aims of the Sharia, by the way, came to protect lineage. Yes, sir? Um, the, with four women, you can have four children. With four men, you can have one child. Okay, that also makes sense. Then we also wish to tell people, that how do you know who's the father? And now they have the audacity to tell you DNA. <laughs> DNA? They just, had, they just made that up, I mean, recently. How about years, for thousands of years, how would they solve that back then? Sure, now you have the solution. All right, uh, real quick. Well, I just, yeah? I just want to add something. There is actually a couple here in Calgary who are happily married. And what do you mean, a couple? Well, the ladies. Uh -huh. yeah, and, and they had a, a chat with my uncle, who's an accountant. And basically the same thing, what you were talking about. So you mean there are two women married to each other, I think? And they're Muslims as well. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, what? Hmm? Okay. See? And they have children? No, not yet. Yeah, see, I mean, look, when, when you go sick, you go sick. And when you're sick, you're sick. You don't have to study. That's not my shit. That's how it works, you know. I mean, the, there's, there's a, docu <coughs> it's not a documentary with an interview with people. I forget. Why? I don't want to get it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still not like like that quick, but okay. Uh, sister? Women are given their marital rights rather than being a woman. Now? Women are given marital rights rather than being a 
right, being for, and if I can be an advocate for women, yeah, I mean, then they're barely getting their rights from one guy now for <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. To look after her? Yeah. Is that the Kabir! <laughs> Just kidding, go ahead, go ahead. I love these topics, I really do, but go ahead. <laughs> So, so, uh, I lost all those points. A anyways, you know I have a poem on multiple marriage, right? But I don't say that publicly. Uh, come on, please. But, uh, come on, come on. We're not going there. No, please, please. Class, we don't have time. We're trying to go fast. Now we would stop for a poll. No, please, I can tell you the last four we'll verses. Half an hour later. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Anyways, so, um, Zakhar uh, Khas, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But you know, you bring up a good point. Yeah. If uh, you know, how does the idda period work? If she's still married to three other men, she has to go through Idda, you know? Makes sense, right? Good point. Yes, sir? Um, you get the benefit of the child tax. <laughs> 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 Sorry, what? I have a future accountant over here. And uh, <laughs> I'm the last one. The first wife has to be a favorite. Has to be? Okay with it. Like with the, we're marrying more than one that wife. Oh. No, no. No, 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 no. That's not right. Give us the poem to clarify these issues. The poem doesn't address that, sir. No, the first one does not have to uh, be in agreement. You know, you can do it on the D M. But no. Ahmed. A man doesn't have to go through unlawful ways. Okay, it also cuts off avenues to evil to a lot of sharp yes, sister. Right, and uh, Allah says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ عَلَى الْعَلَى الْخَوْمِ I remember it, but I like the, how the sisters quickly can finish the verse for you. So it's not the khair, yeah, and look, a lot of times brothers, they think it's just a macho thing, yeah, I want two, yeah, I want three, it's just like, you know, just the fantasy world that they live in. You know, take care of that one. We have severe, severe problems with taking care of one wife, you know? Like one speaker said, he said, you know, he used to try to analyze the whole divorce issue. In the end, he just, after years of looking at it, you know what his conclusion was? He said, the men are just not real men. Yeah. It's true, isn't it? The men are not real men. That's all. Look at the stuff that we do to sisters. It's horrible. Last, last, last one. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why can't you control yourself, Trump, as if we do it in this society? Huh? <laughs> as, if, as if we what in this society? That never, no one is faithful in this society. They're either cheating in reality or cheating with their eyes or in some other way. No one is actually faithful. They say they uh, only marry one wife here, but they're not. No, no one's okay, so this. you're firing back and saying, look, it's, it's, you know, in one way or another, it's actually happening. No one's really a one woman man. Okay, but go ahead. Go ahead. Last one. Last one. Go sure. ahead. Because it happened in the last lecture uh, in Toronto, um, and the reason is like I'm just thinking like so what would happen if the women population grows? Because in India, if you look at it now, it's 60-40 ratio. Mm. 60 are women and 40 are men. So how would you compensate them? Yes, I I love your concern for the brother's <laughs> 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 well, very concerned for the. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just playing with this. <laughs> Excellent. You know, he's thinking Calgary, he's thinking India. Global brother, global brother. Great. You know, one time, uh, this one chef, and don't get me started with that chef, but he said this woman, yeah, he, he said this at a lecture actually, he said this woman came to him and she said, you know, this non Muslim, like, you women, you, you marry four women, and all that is because of, she said, SEX? Sheikh Wadi said, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? No, one is for chess, one is for ping pong, yes, it's there, you know, just like why they, they look at it like, oh, you got this, the whole 70 virgins and 71 for how they look at it like, you, you mentioned that? Yes, and that's why you had some speakers that, that went, uh, they went, uh, you know, went wimpy after 9-11, right? When the guy said that, uh, you know, the, the hur al is actually a cotton flower. You, have, you heard that? Okay, alhamdulillah, there's some guy in the States and he's very, very popular, you know. <coughs> so, so, so he said that the hur al is a cotton flower. Cotton flower? So when Allah says, وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورٍ عِينٍ We wet them the cotton flowers? I don't know what you're planning to do with the cotton flowers. What, what on earth is this? And what do you do? You talk to the cotton flower or something? Why would Allah wed you to a cotton flower? So, but you know, people just went wimpy, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, we need some serious editing for that. Thing. <laughs> Just go on YouTube unless I see it. So. Um, look, uh, look, let's end it. Ahmed, next one. Now, I don't have time to stop in every argument and say, look, this is, he's using this method, using that method. But you're getting the idea. Ahmed, next so, uh, one. So, different sects in Islam, which one is the, is the right okay. sect? Or different religions? Mark that one with the Shia, I will come to it later. Uh, what came before God? What came before God? And the answer is? Nothing. Nothing. And if they say how, 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 we can't wrap our minds around it, people. And there's things in this dunya we can't wrap our minds around. So don't, you know, don't insist on wrapping your mind around this one issue, and you won't be able to. And we can take it back to our point that Basu said, look, this is the situation. Allah is there, He was always there. How? I don't know. But He's there, and you're here. What are you going to do about it? Right? Quickly. You're not allowed to ask how. But this is a non-Muslim. He doesn't know that. You know. So, yeah, but if you're right. The brother is saying that you know, in certain things, we don't ask how. How did Allah said on his throne? We don't ask that. How did he create? We don't ask that. A non-Muslim asks you how, or, you know, how come nothing came before God, what have you. We don't know the answer to that. Ahmed, next one. Uh, this one says, uh, in Bukhari, it said that Okay, we'll skip it for now. Okay, why does God need us to worship? We did that one, right? We, we did that one, correct? Evolution. Evolution. <coughs> do evolution now? Yeah. Okay, let's hear it real quick. Yeah. Why are there still monkeys around? Why are there still monkeys around? Uh, and basically his argument is how come these monkeys, what happened to them that they didn't evolve into human beings? How do animals go extinct? How do animals go extinct? There is no intermediate fossils available in the missing link? Yeah, so you know they tell us that you know, you know the fish became this and this became that and that became this, but they don't show us the middle part when they're halfway between because the missing link also between the ape, the human, all these things. So it's and by the way, it's called the what of evolution, the theory of evolution. When people tell me Big Bang theory or theory of evolution, before I even discuss it, I say you know what a theory is. And what is a theory? Myth. It's not really myth, but theory. Uh, yeah, it's like yeah, it's like basically a, it's, it's conjecture. It's like a scientific guess, you know. They're, they're, it's a guess. You know, it's not proven. It's not fact. It's not like a hypothesis that you can set up an experiment to test your hypothesis whether it's right or wrong. You know that, right? You can't set up an experiment to prove a theory. You know, that, right? Any scientists in the room? Okay, am I right or wrong? Am I right? Or am I not wrong? <laughs> Thank you. These are the choices.